Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us asynchronously and virtually. Um, as you might know, here at the Sharmin and Bijan Mosava Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies at Princeton University, we have been hosting virtual conversations in place of actual events. My name is Maryam Alamzadeh, and I am a postdoctoral research associate at the center and I'm delighted to be hosting this session with Professor Manata Hashemi. Let me introduce her uh, uh, briefly first. Uh, Dr. Hashemi is the Farzana Family Assistant Professor of Iranian Studies at the Department of International and Area Studies at the University of Oklahoma. She is a sociologist studying inequality, urban poverty, and the role of culture in socioeconomic practices. Her work on lower class youth's everyday life and their struggle with mobility in Iran and more generally in the Middle East has appeared in an amazing array of places, including International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, Qualitative Sociology, International Journal of Middle East Studies, and the British Journal of Middle East Studies, and the Muslim World. Professor Hashemi holds a PhD in sociology from the University of California, uh, Berkeley. And before becoming an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma, she served as a research director at Qatar Foundation, an experience very few young scholars, young academics have, and was also a postdoctoral fellow at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service in Qatar. Today, she will be talking about her recently published book, which is um, I'm personally very excited about. Uh, the title is Coming of Age in Iran, Poverty and the Struggle for Dignity. It has come out earlier this year with New York University Press, and uh, I believe it's highly needed. It was highly needed and it's very timely. And so without further ado, I'd ask Monata to tell us a bit about the book, and then we will have a conversation to further explore the book and its uh, very interesting topic. Monata, the screen is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the very kind introduction, and thank you for having me here today. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, um, you know, and I think it's wonderful what the Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies at Princeton is doing these days to bring everyone together around these new research studies. Um, so I guess I'll just talk a little bit about the book itself. Um, and, you know, at its heart, coming of age in Iran is really looking at what it means to be young, what it means to be poor and aspirational in Iran today. And, you know, I think this becomes really important in the current context of Iran, even before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, um, the Islamic Republic was facing a really brutal economic climate as a result of U.S. sanctions that have really devastated businesses, industries, people's savings, um, many people's earnings, you know, they're not enough to make up for the escalating cost of living in Iran. Um, young people are not only facing a really bleak job market, but they're also dealing with the added pressure of daily inflation and sanctions that have made access to goods and services difficult. And all of this is really compounded for those youth who are located at the bottom of the social ladder, those who are sort of regularly cast to the margins. Um, so given this context, the book is really about how these young people are struggling to not just manage their lives or to cope, but really to find meaning within them and to assert dignity. And the central question that the book is trying to answer is, you know, how do young people who have few resources and who live in these protracted conditions of economic uncertainty, like we see in Iran today, how do they go about improving their lives in ways that are valuable to them? Um, what are some of the creative emancipatory projects, so to speak, that they're undertaking? And what does this tell us more generally about how opportunity and inequality operate in environments that are marked by insecurity? And you know, this really speaks to what I find interesting and a common thread in my research, which is how stigmatized or marginalized identities are created, how they're reproduced, how they're challenged in people's efforts to claim belonging in their communities. Um, so for this book to really understand the how, to understand how young people are coping, I conducted almost 
39 months of participant observation field research between the years 2008 and 2019 among youth who were between 15 and 29. Um, and I also did interviews with 44 youth, and this just sort of reinforced the patterns that I was seeing in my observations. So for the field work, I actually wanted to go beyond the capital city of Tehran, not just look at Tehran, but also look at, you know, young people living in Iran's provinces. There's been a lot of work that's been focused on Tehran, um, and rightfully so. But I was curious to see how, you know, people who are living in other cities and towns in Iran were managing life and how practices are, you know, transmitted from the center to the peripheries, so to speak. Um, so the majority of my field work actually occurred in Saudi, the capital of Mazandaran province um, in the north of Iran. But I also conducted field work in the poorest districts in South Tehran, just to verify what I was seeing in Saudi. And what I ended up finding was that, you know, despite the different geographies and compositions of the two sites, there were very similar patterns in young people's thoughts and practices. So with this book project, um, I initially entered the field to understand how low-income young Iranians who comprise a large portion of the population in Iran, how they manage, right, under conditions of hardship. What I came to find as my field work in Iran progressed was that expectations around how a person should present herself in front of others to gain approval, her face, um, exert a really strong influence in these young people's everyday choices and their coping strategies, but it also influenced the way others reacted to them. In other words, saving face um, ob or oberu in Persian really structured social life in the communities I studied. So this very subjective emotional desire to save face among some lower class young Iranians, a group that I call face savers in the book, um, it really shaped the way they went about objectively improving their lives. What I found was that the better able some youth were to conform to collective norms, to conform to the social order, the higher their chances of getting social and economic rewards. Communities ended up giving benefits to youth who they judged as sort of displaying admired behaviors, to youth who they perceived as being respectable. Um, and the youth themselves, interestingly enough, also internalized this, evaluating other youth on the basis of their conformity to socially acceptable behaviors. And you know, this is all really fascinating to me because it goes against a lot of underlying assumptions we may have and studies even that have shown that living on the margins of society can often lead disadvantaged youth to reject mainstream ideologies or to you know, rebel against authority all in an effort to get validation. Here we have a case where the opposite is true. Um, there are also some youth who are actively trying to comply to these ideologies to get ahead. They find this incredibly important. Um, and in fact, in Shia Islamic doctrine, as it's practiced in Iran, al biru face is seen and promoted as sort of the most significant protector of a person's character. To lose face then leads to the loss of a person's social standing. So by losing his metaphorical face, a person is considered to be morally destitute, which in Iran was many times seen by you know, people I spoke with as being worse than just being materially poor. And if we look at it in this way, um, losing face be becomes much more costly for those who have little else besides their reputations to bank on. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to bring a few quotes from my research. Um, so for instance, one of my interlocutors, a young woman, she told me, Rich people are comfortable, they can dress how they want. Even if they go outside naked, people won't say anything. It's us poor ones who, no matter what we do, are still judged in other people's eyes. You know, and of course, this is an exaggeration of the relative freedom of movement of the rich in Iran, but it does show the extent to which you know, some youth really believe that they always have to be on guard since they feel that all eyes are always on them. Um, this idea of the public judgment, though, is also really central to this story. As community members differentiate between young people who do or don't abide by social expectations, they create this type of informal social control. 
And we really see this form of control happen when young men and women who make a good show of themselves are rewarded, while those who don't are punished. So there's a deeply performative aspect to this whole process. And to avoid punishment and shame, the youth I spent time with, they attempted to follow a certain moral code, what I call in the book a face game, which consisted of four rules that would allow them to present an image of themselves that was consistent with expectations. And these four rules were, you know, being seen as responsible, being seen as hardworking, appearing virtuous. So for instance, not engaging in drug use. And finally, being seen as classy or with it in the know. Um, and I constantly saw how those youth who were better able to play by these rules were considered model youth. They became seen as you know, deserving of aid or of rewards. On the other hand, the youth who failed to win at the game were cast even further to the margins. And here I just wanted to you know, give a few examples of the face game in action. So for instance, to avoid being judged by others as sort of lazy or as delinquent, the young people I spoke with, they work diligently. They try to avoid being associated with you know, the wrong people like petty criminals or drug dealers. Even though there was rarely enough formal sector work to go around, they got creative. So for instance, um, many of the youth I knew, they worked in the informal economy as shop apprentices or they worked as street vendors or as seamstresses from their homes. Um, many set up you know, at-home salons. Those who couldn't find any type of work for whatever reason, you know, they took up unpaid work helping with a family business or babysitting even, all in an effort to appear hardworking. And by doing this, they could assume the moral high ground regardless of how little money they were actually making. And engaging in work or at least appearing to be hardworking and responsible was especially important to young men because judgments of their manliness hinge on their ability to provide. For instance, um, a local community member told me there's something wrong with a young man who doesn't work. Maybe he's on drugs or he's involved with the, young, with the wrong people. So for men, it was this very public display of masculinity revolving around perceptions of their hard work ethic or their self-sufficiency that became the marker of their reputations. Um, and other examples of the face rules in an attempt to hide their poverty and avoid shame, some of the youth I knew, they spent the limited amount of money they made on the latest trends like iPhones or you know, Samsung smartphones or brand name clothes just so they could appear as they told me classy. Um, and they often try to copy fashions that were foreign and in style among the middle classes and the well-off in Iran. Not surprisingly, um, this rule of self-aestheticization was much more costly for women um, because young women didn't face the same sort of social stigma as men for not working. This meant that they often had to rely on the most immediate visible feature of themselves that could signal their worthiness, which was their physical appearances. So looking classy or looking chic, as they told me, became an even stronger imperative sometimes for the young women I knew. They would manipulate their bodies through exercise or surgery, um, their clothes, they would manipulate even their accents all in an effort to get the right look that was sort of admired by their peers or by members of mainstream Iranian society. Um, you know, but looking classy, being hardworking, none of it, in the very end, none of it really meant much if face savers weren't judged to be morally virtuous or pure, pock in Persian. So in practical terms, for the young men and women I talked to, this meant not being sexually promiscuous, not doing drugs, not hanging out with quote unquote wrongdoers. In fact, they went out of their way, for instance, to not be seen hanging out in certain parts of the city that had a reputation for being shady areas of town. And in all of this, being able to adhere to this moral code created these abstract status distinctions between good and bad youth. But it also had more tangible consequences since those who were able to save face and win the game, in a sense, were able to monopolize social and economic resources in ways that those who failed at the game couldn't. 
What I found was that positive evaluations by those around them gave youth who followed the rules um, these small increments in moral status. It gave them moral capital, in other words, which they could then figuratively exchange for social and financial opportunities. Time and time again, um, I saw how youth were really meticulous in their appearances and really careful in presenting this front of responsibility, class, purity, they became favored in their communities. They were the ones who were given jobs, promotions, expensive gifts. Um, they were the ones who could easily embed themselves in the middle class networks. And this brought with it its own set of perceived perks like well-connected friends who could hook them up with jobs or information about job opportunities. So not only did um, submitting to what society wants, as youth told me, not only did this compliance appeal to them because it conferred recognition and self-worth, but the submission also provided concrete incentives that they could use to then materially improve their lives in small increments to gain what I call incremental mobility within poverty. So ultimately how some disadvantaged youth strategized to live in a way that was meaningful to them became a really important factor in determining whether or not they could ultimately break free of the hand that they were dealt in life. Um, and I guess, you know, one question that this all might raise is where is the Islamic Republic in this narrative? Um, what role does the state play perhaps in these young people's pursuit of status recognition and their desires to gain upward mobility? And here I would say that the state plays a really influential role. These status aspirations that we see among this particular group of youth at least are the cumulative result of decades of effort by the state to integrate Iran into the global economy, to develop Iran into a middle-income country. The regime, and I, you know, I saw this acutely in Saudi and in Tehran, the regime has instituted, for instance, cultural centers in the poorest areas of South Tehran, where I worked, that provided you know, free or low-cost cultural activities like art classes or music classes, activities that have traditionally been reserved for more elite groups. Um, these same sort of cultural centers are in Saudi, and they're frequented by both the rich and the poor alike. There are numbers of, you know, state charitable foundations, as well as NGOs in both cities that are targeted towards, you know, the empowerment of the lower classes. There are huge numbers of educational institutions um, across both cities, and in fact, across the country. And what all of these initiatives have done has been to raise young people's aspirations. Low-income young people, for instance, they're now in close contact with the upper classes in ways that they weren't in the past. They see the opportunities now, and they can even experience some of those opportunities. And that all works to raise their expectations. Um, but the state is also actively promoting many of the aesthetics and values that these youth are trying to embrace. So for instance, official speeches emphasize the importance of you know, hard work and self-discipline in advancing the nation. Um, since its inception, the regime has codified into law ideas of what it means to be a proper, pure citizen. Um, the reminders of Islamic values, of self-discipline, of moral purity throughout Iran in the form of paintings, performances, um, posters. In a similar way, TV shows, billboards, ads, Throughout Iran, many of them advertise the latest you know, foreign trends that the youth I knew were coveting. The clothing and accessories that are promoted by salesmen as the best are often the ones that are either foreign or that mimic foreign trends. And they have you know, these brand names, even if they're knockoffs. So a globalized commercial culture has also really seeped into Iran, shaping ideas of what it means to be a citizen in the Islamic Republic. And it's this desire for both material advancement and morality that defines modernity in the state's eyes. And for the youth I spent time with, presenting themselves as you know, these good modern citizens by playing the game helped them to escape stigma. It didn't necessarily always help them escape poverty. In fact, many of them are still struggling but it did help them to gain recognition in their communities. That mattered to them, that in itself was valuable to them. Um, and in fact, what I found really interesting in all of this is that even though these youth are 
putting on this performative front, they also become invested in it. They internalize the game. One of the young men I knew, for instance, said, I have to be true to myself. Um, when I think something is okay in my eyes, but it's not okay in the eyes of society, <clears throat> I try not to do it. I try to live in a good way. If people remember you as good, this is reason to be proud. So for the youth I knew, playing the game, it's not just about accruing material rewards, but it's more about being um, good people. The game helps to create the moral self that they think they should be. And for them, practice makes perfect. Um, but while playing the game is a useful strategy for some people, it can also bring its own pitfalls. And I wanted to end by just briefly bringing up a comment made by one of the locals I spoke with. So as he told me, I know a family who's in need, but it's better not to help them because they'll spend all the help that they can get on cigarettes and bad things like that. And to me, this comment really illustrates that focusing too intensely on conforming can also hurt those who are the most in need of help. It can depict people who've failed to conform to expectations for whatever reason as undeserving. So when community members see success as this sort of you know, Darwinian competition where only the most morally fit deserve to advance, this culture of poverty mentality, blaming the poor for their poverty, comes to be adopted and reproduced among local communities themselves. And you know, what this tells us is that at the end of the day, this game, it's neither completely good nor is it completely bad. While the face game can help some people gain these small victories, it can also serve as a poverty trap for others and reproduce cycles of inequality. But the game still continues. And it continues in part because it provides an opportunity for the youth who play it to have a chance at getting a better material life. But you know, it also continues and becomes this sort of ingrained code of conduct um, because some youth believe that the rules of the game define the right way to live. So ultimately for them, it's not just about managing everyday life and moving up the ladder when you're faced with hardship, but it's also about being a good person and leading sort of a dignified moral existence in the midst of all this uncertainty that they're facing. So yeah, this is one story of what it means to come of age in Iran. Um, I'll end here and I'm happy to talk about this more. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, as I said, I am excited about this book um, and I really enjoyed the talk uh, as well on so many different levels. Uh, maybe the most important one being that because post-revolutionary Iran is such a controversial topic, both historically and politically, um, most, like almost all of the studies uh, on Iran, on contemporary Iran, have focused on the re revolution uh, as a defining factor, very righteously. I mean, um, uh, it's not to criticize that, but I do that myself. Um, <laughs> So there's little time and space and intellectual energy left to address um, um, the nuances of the contemporary Iranian society. Um, I really personally feel the um, lack of such studies because as you show, Iran is not just about politics or religion or the history of the two. Everyday life um, like is... Um, is on the move uh, mm -hmm. at its own pace with its own nuances and a ton of interesting things uh, within it, interesting patterns, interesting um, um, formations to study mm -hmm. as um, you um, give us a good glimpse of. So yes. thank you for that. Um, so as a, I think you said it beautifully yourself that uh, the one of the main points in the book is, is that youth is not always about resistance. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's, it can be about abidance and compliance mm -hmm. to be able to make a sense of life when you're short of resources. I, I see uh, your work as part of a kind of a synthesis of two previous um, sort of common understandings, one being the classic Marxist view that the lower classes are 
doped into the, to their current situation and there can only be a like a, a full scale revolt to uh, bring them out of this um, like um, false consciousness and like uh, bring them to the place they deserve to be. But then um, later on in uh, the late 20th century, I would say, uh, there was uh, this this uh, new understanding that you pointed out that actually during their everyday life, uh, even people with um, um, fewer resources are showing signs of resistance with their with their uh, clothing styles, with their choice of music, uh, with their drug consumption, and so on and so forth. And that kind of uh, understanding literature has set well also within Iranian studies. There has been a lot of that going on, like how um, wearing your hijab more loosely is a sign of resistance, um, um, like holding um, secret parties and so on and so forth. We all know uh, the examples. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also the synthesis of, okay, cultural capital plays an important role. It's not just about uh, either uh, resistance, like going against the norms and the capital, or the material conditions that needs to be revolutionized. Revolutionized. Huh? <laughs> um, it, cultural capital is also something you can gain by compliance, by following the rules and norms of the society. Um, and there's also so this debate of how do um, the, the the norms, the abidance by uh, the moral code, these interact with the structural material uh, conditions of everyday life, right? Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us more uh, about where you stand in this debate. How do you, um, like, how much did you find um, that the, uh, the poor uh, among the youth uh, are aware of this systematic inequality? What is the degree of these face savers awareness of the structural biases and the limits of their gains through the face system? And how does it affect this everyday uh, rhythm that mm. they have fallen into? Um, yeah, I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, um, no, that's a really interesting question. And thank you um, for highlighting sort of these broader structural forces that are impinging on them. Um, so as you mentioned there, and I guess it's sort of a roundabout way of answering the question, but um, so the book isn't to say that, you know, resistance does not happen um, or that, you know, the middle classes, let's say a young middle class woman, she might engage in a resistance by wearing her manto open, right? Or wearing her hijab in a certain way. But among the youth that I, that I looked at, um, when they talk about why they're wearing certain articles of clothing or why they're mimicking the styles of, let's say, the middle class, none of them justify it in terms of, you know, I'm trying to make a political statement or I'm trying to sort of, you know, assert my identity. They're saying that, you know, this is, this is what it means to look cool. Um, I want people to not think that I'm poor. Um, I want to be able to fit in. And so I think it's really important to pay attention to the meanings that people attach themselves to their practices. Um, an object can take on different meanings depending on what person you talk to or what group of people you're talking to. I mean, I think these you know, these youth, they are aware of the broader inequalities in Iranian society. And for them, they feel that complying by the rules because it has worked so far, because it has been able to give them these sort of incremental, whether they're social gains or economic gains, it has been able to get them one step closer to their aspirations. Um, they feel that this is the right way to go. Um, it, it, uh, for them, you know, engagement in political protests, for instance, it's costly. Um, most of them, most of the young people I spoke with, they're the primary breadwinners of their families. They can't, you know, afford the consequences or the perceived consequences that might happen if they engage in sort of radical political engagements. Um, 
their parents rely on them, their siblings rely on them. Most of them work 18 hour days, 12 hour days. They don't have time to engage in these political resistances. And so for them, they sort of do this cost benefit, this very strategic cost benefit analysis. And they realize, you know, going the way that we're going, gaining status and recognition in the community, it's um, giving us a dignified life and it's giving us a life that we're comfortable with. Um, and to them that, you know, that's important and to them that matters. And I think it's important to sort of take people's own understandings and meanings that they attach as significant. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answers the question, but. No, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, that's very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask this question later, but it's very relevant, I, I guess, to bring it up now. Um, so what happens that um, um, like um, such a, a group of people, I don't want to say class, but I mean, of course, there's uh, diversity. Um, what, what happens when people with such mindset come to a point of uh, revolting, of like, should, um, kind of um, bringing their resistance, their intention uh, to um, go against the structures to, to an obvious and um, blunt point, as we know has happened like recently in Iran several times. Mm -hmm. um, is it just like a pressure, like the pressure accumulating and a tipping point? Is it, a, do you think it's a different group of people who have not really been immersed in this uh, moral code and become comfortable with it. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you can tell us more about that. Yeah, so, you know, inequality in Iran right now is at one of the highest rates it's ever been in Iran's recent history. Um, and I found that as social polarizations and as income inequality between Iran's haves and have nots increase, and they have steadily been increasing, people um, basically elaborate difference and privilege as a way to deal with uncertainty. Um, instead of you know, using economics as a benchmark of success, they're using morality as a benchmark of success at least among the youth that I studied. Um, and as, you know, I suspect that as inequality increases, people are going to find new ways to differentiate themselves. So for these youth, you know, they were, you know, they told me and I saw how they would sort of say, well, we're better than the rich because at least we help others. You know, the rich, they're, they're too stingy. We're better than our peers who live in the same neighborhood because they're kind of backward and they're not modern and we are and we take care of our appearances. So they're creating these new pathways to differentiate themselves and reassert their identity and cultural belonging. Um, and, you know, there's a tendency within analyses um, to sort of assume that there's a direct causal relationship between economic deprivation and radical political engagement. And actually research has shown that there's not a one-to-one -one causal relationship between poverty and radical political engagement. And I'm not talking about, you know, labor unrest and, you know, more mundane acts of protest that happen on a more consistent basis in Iran. And, you know, that doesn't hit the news cycles because they're not these spectacular moments of political upheaval. But I think that, um, you know, these more mundane acts of everyday life, they can hold just as much power in affecting social change. And I think these youth realize it. This isn't to say that, you know, for young people who've failed at the game, who've become shunned by their communities, who feel that there's no other way for them to achieve their goals, that they won't be drawn into sort of more radical, either to crime or delinquency or more you know, radical political engagements. But what I found was that for these youth, you know, their aspirations might not be the same as youth in the middle classes or youth in the upper classes, but they're, um, but, but they consistently find really creative individualistic strategies to meet the aspirations that they do have. And that serves as a deterrent for them from sort of devolving into or going into a life of crime or, you know, engaging in these more radical political protests. Mm -hmm. It just occurred to me actually that um, like in the spirit of this being a conversation um, that abiding by the system, just like immersing oneself in the, uh, in the ethos that is prescribed by the society, by um, the, the uh, 
uh, better off people um, kind of might have like a, a, a heavier emotional um, burden when you see that it's not paying off and actually might mm -hmm. become a trigger itself for um, taking a radical turn. Um, just, yeah, throwing something out. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I think it's really um, important for future studies to look into. Um, this is just, you know, one, a first step. And I'm sure, you know, and the book isn't claiming that all youth in Iran are like this, or like all low-income youth, but, you know, at least among this group of youth that I spent um, time with, they sort of internalized the system. It became this habitus in a way. Um, and it, and sometimes they, you know, just did the rules without thinking about them consciously. It was sort of this subconscious behaviors that they engaged in, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. The, the consequences can be much, um, much harder to bear when they don't pan out. Yeah. Um, my next question is also very much related and I found it fascinating that you um, bringing this um, uh, aspect of norms and um, um, the moral code, the safe facing rules and how it's like interconnected into the everyday efforts of uh, uh, the poor youth, youth to uh, like incrementally move, the, like find their way up. And you had amazing examples of how this sort of uh, cultural capital that they gain through this compliance um, can be translated into um, actual like material or social capital. For example, if you dress nicely, you get to hang out with uh, like better off people, they might open opportunities for you. I really enjoyed uh, that kinds of examples. Uh, but I was also constantly asking myself when I was reading your book, is there a limit to this transferability? Um, mm -hmm. And um, like, first, is there a limit? Like, how far can one get? Like, how and um, how self-aware of this incremental movement uh, are? Uh, people who are within this movement, you know, like um, what are their aspirations? What is the limit of uh, their aspirations? And also, um, as uh, it, um, uh, one of your examples uh, hit me actually that sometimes it might not be like this. This uh, playing the face saving game might not be a strategic move towards. Uh, feeling a, like a better person, a more like morally uh, pure person, or as a, um, a conduit to uh, like financial gains, neither of them, but just like trying to match up with peers, living a, a more luxurious life. The example uh, that, that uh, gave me this thought was uh, the, gar the girl whose uh, mother, I believe, was uh, selling uh, their house, and the mother wanted the the children to invest their share of the uh, in, the the uh, money that would come in into um, I don't remember exactly something for the future, but the girl wanted to spend it on a nose job um, mm -hmm. because, like, she felt that that would that was what she wanted at that point. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> um, so. I think her pseudonym was Mina, um, and her mom basically was building this house in their in their village back home. And you know, she said, "Well, you know, I'm going to give half of this house is for you, and the other half is for your sister." And and Mina said, "Well, you know, just give me pay, give me my half in cash now, so I can get this rhinoplasty." And it was really interesting because all her friends were very upper class elite members of Saudi society. And so for her, the way, I mean, barring this incident, the way she dressed, her mannerisms, everything was sort of geared towards gaining accept acceptance in this social group. And you're absolutely right. Um, you know, she was still studying. She didn't really um, think that, you know, the rhinoplasty would get her an economic opportunity or translate into an economic reward. But for her, it was just a way for her to fit in more with that particular group of youth that she was with. Um, and, and, you know, I saw this constantly. So for instance, young women, they, or 
or men, um, they wouldn't buy dinner, which was something that was that wasn't so publicly visible in order to be able to buy a really expensive wedding gift so they could not lose face among their families. So people wouldn't think they were poor. Um, they would forgo buying diapers for their infant children. Um, so just so they could buy household furnishings so that when guests came into their home, they wouldn't think that, you know, they were poor. Um, so there's a lot of motivations sort of um, act on people's um, choices and strategies that they adopt. I wanted to, um, you mentioned this really great point about the limits to the transferability of capital. Um, and I guess, you know, one point I do bring up in the book is that just because a young person has accrued moral capital, just because they are, you know, they gain status within the community, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to gain social and economic gains. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be able to transfer it, transfer it into, um, you know, a, a job or a promotion or social connections. Um, and I'll just give one, uh, two, yeah, one example. Um, so I knew this young man. He was sort of the model, model young person in the community. People, um, you know, thought that he was he was hardworking and he was able to. Um, you know, ultimately go into college um, due to his connections, due to his family's connections. Um, and, you know, he's doing very well for himself now. He had a friend who was also sort of this model youth, also very hardworking. Um, but by the time I caught up with him, he was a day laborer. And even though he had gotten into college, he didn't go because his family couldn't afford it, even though both families had sort of the same, came from the same socioeconomic background. And what was interesting in this case was that the first young man, his parents allowed him to go hang out um, with family friends. He went out and hung out with a family friend who owned a grocery store. He was able to gain sort of connections through, through that family friend. Whereas the second young man, his mother was hypervigilant in controlling him and sort of monitoring his movements. He wasn't able to form sort of the connections that he needed in order to get ahead later on in life. So even, um, and there are multiple stories like this. So maybe there's a death in the family and the young person has to drop out of school in order to work. Maybe the father is a drug user and that affects the young person's grades. And unfortunately, what ends up happening is that communities see the end result. They don't see all these structural factors that impinge on the young person's ability to be able to translate that moral capital they accrue into, um, into opportunities that can help them down the line. Yeah. That is that is really interesting. Um, I actually thought that uh, I could bring this up to give you a chance to bring more of your examples in because um, there wasn't oh, no. much space in the talk uh, mm -hmm. to do that and they are all fascinating. Um, could you tell us more about the complexities of the uh, face system, the rules? Because through your examples, it comes out that it's not just one like cohesive system of expectations that these uh, young people are um, uh, playing along. They are, it's like they're moving um, uh, spheres and have to kind of abide by the rules of the new spheres as they move along. Um, like what I had in mind was, for example, the way uh, young uh, women are supposed to dress within their own, like more religious communities and how they have to switch um, when they uh, want to enter another sphere. So if you could uh, say more about that, um, sure. um, that'd be great. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of code switching going on. Um, so for instance, young women or young men, you know, when they're, most of these youth that I knew, they lived in peri-urban neighborhoods or in neighborhoods where um, neighbors were more conservatively minded, family friends lived there and they expected the young person to dress modestly, act modestly, for instance, not wear as much makeup, not wear high heeled shoes if they were a woman, you know, not make their hair into these fashionable hairstyles if they were young men. Um, but then when they went out, so these youth follow that code, right? Um, when they were in their communities, but then when they went out into city streets or when they were with their peers, they would dress in another way that would be acceptable to them. And sometimes, you know, um, youth would get caught. So I bring up 
a um, couple of examples in the book where like the young person was dressed, and I was actually with them. Um, they were dressed in a certain way. We were walking um, around in the in the city, and neighbors caught them and said, "Well, you know, they chastised them. What are you doing out? Why are you dressed like this?" And you know, they justified it later on. They justified, "Well, they're backward. They don't know. They're not modern. They they're not classy. We're classy." Um, and for them, you know, sometimes you did a cost-benefit analysis again, right? The risks that came from being chastised, to, in their mind's eye, was a lot less than the benefits that would come from being accepted by, you know, the certain peer group or by being seen by broader society um, as, you know, somebody who's not poor, who's classy, maybe, you know, forming connections in that way. So it's really this interesting process of how young people code switched and also justify times when they were sort of caught in the act. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. I mean, um, maybe it's not totally surprising that people will um, um, like modify their behavior and their looks um, given the, the social context. But the fact that you show that this all comes in together in a uh, an everyday um, sort of um, effort to make this all meaningful, to um, to move upwards a little by little, I think, um, sheds new light on it. Um, I also wanted to ask you and uh, first say that the, uh, the decentralization that you do, taking away the focus from Tehran into other cities, sorry, specifically, I think is fascinating. Uh, I mean, you're doing this double move from the middle class to the lower and also from the center to peripheries. So um, it would be great if you can tell us more about that as well. And uh, you mentioned in the talk that um, you found that despite the geographic and uh, other types of differences, there is a commonalities being seen. I was wondering if there are also differences that stood out to you when you were doing field work. And um, yeah, what basically the uh, insights that you gained by doing this center periphery comparison. Yeah, um, so a lot of, and I'm sure you know, a lot of um, ethnographic studies, most studies on Iran tend to focus on Tehran, and rightfully so. It's a mega city. It's a really great social laboratory to see how, you know, the theories we're learning about, how they um, end up in practice. And I think we need more work, more ethnographies on, on Tehran. But at the same time, um, Iran is not Tehran. Most Iranians are not Tehranis. And you know, it, it, it's really, I think it's crucial to see how ideologies, how practices, they're appropriated or challenged um, when you take them out of Tehran and you sort of look at the provinces. Um, so for me, in looking at Mazandaran, initially I went because, you know, as you know, Tehran is cordoned off geographically, more or less. This has changed in recent years, but it's cordoned off geographically by class northern areas of the city, upper classes, middle areas of the city, middle classes, the southern areas, the lower classes. Um, but in Saudi, um, there's a much more integrated um, urban structure. So the rich and the poor live more or less side by side, either in the same neighborhood or even in the same apartment complex. So initially I thought, you know, hey, this would be a really great comparative access, um, access to see how these different urban configurations impinge on young people's aspirations, how they impinge on young people's strategies of action. You know, as I mentioned, what I ended up finding was that, you know, aspirations, their practices they were pretty similar in both cities. And, you know, this was because, um, as I eventually came to find, Saudi, just like Tehran, has a really, really rich history of post-revolutionary land provisions. Um, the government gave large tracts of abandoned land to low-income groups in Saudi, in Mazandaran, um, just as they did in Tehran. Um, Saudi has a very vibrant civil society scene. It has one of the highest numbers of NGOs in the country. Tehran has the highest. Um, the, they're very similar types of cultural institutions in Saudi, similar to what you would find in Tehran. And what I found was that, you know, the young people I knew, not only did they use all of these um, programs, 
um, and centers and, and initiatives. But what I found was that these social development, sort of state-sponsored social development initiatives had the effect of normalizing aspirations. Um, in a way, it, both of them, in both cities, you see this in bourgeoisiement of Iranian society beyond the middle classes. And in these climates that are marked by these sort of pro-poor development initiatives, um, it's really fostered the similar types of aspirations and strategies of action, coping strategies among youth. Now, you know, if we were to go to Sistan or Baluchistan, which has much higher poverty rates, they're not, um, those provinces are not characterized by the same level of social development initiatives. We might see something completely different. The face system might look completely different. People's coping strategies might look different. And I think we need more research to see these differences between provinces. Um, and this is just, you know, this book is just one one step in that direction, but obviously much more needs to be done. Yeah, I, I agree that this has opened a um, um, door to uh, a lot more research that needs to be done, but that's a wonderful first step. It provides the platform um, to, to go and see places that, it, yeah, you're absolutely right, like um, the Southern provinces um, and many more geographical uh, locations in Iran that are like radically different from mm -hmm. Tehran, it would be interesting. But it's also uh, great that you have enough similarity between Saudi and Tehran to be able to make the comparisons. So I think that's um, a great accomplishment already. Yeah. Um, I see that we are uh, almost at time, but I wanted to uh, ask uh, this last question of, what do you think are the policy implications of your findings, uh, both in Iran and also uh, in the wider context? I know you have also worked on the Middle East and uh, uh, have also done some research uh, within the US and the uh, uh, health system and the distribution of the uh, services. Um, so I guess I'm asking two questions in one. One is, why is Iran unique and why like is your case generalizable so to speak um, in what aspects is it unique in what aspects uh, is it also um, useful for gaining insights about the rest of the world uh, like for example you, you when you were talking about uh, this idea of uh, this uh, idea prevalent in the communities that it's only the morally pure that deserve um, uh, protection, yeah. which we see almost everywhere, right? Um, the like within the U.S., say the homeless shelters, they um, 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 they have policies towards like drug use and so on and so forth. Um, so, what are the overlaps and what are the uh, uh, um, w what are the places where Iran like shines a new light on what we already know? And yeah, what is the policy implication of those overlaps and um, uniquenesses. Yeah, um, so just, and I guess, you know, talking about the policy implications was, will also highlight the similarities and differences. Um, as you mentioned, you know, there's this idea, and it's not just prevalent in Iran, but it's also prevalent in the U.S. that, you know, the poor are responsible for their poverty. Um, there's some with them, right? Um, you know, they're either not working hard enough or they're not trying to, they're, they have their own subcultures or they're not following mainstream norms. And this is why they're not um, able to succeed. And, you know, what I found, what other scholars have found, you know, working in the U.S., um, you know, in my work in Iran is that, you know, they're actually trying their hardest to comply by these broader social norms. They work hard. Um, and their downfall isn't because, you um, they're not working hard or there's something wrong with them, but their downfall is because of these structural constraints, as I mentioned earlier, that sort of impinge, especially in these young people's lives, that sort of impinge on their ability um, to reap the rewards of what they, of what they sow. So just at, at a very basic level is understanding, creating that awareness. 
um, that structural issues um, that have caused young people who try their hardest to still get caught in this poverty trap. I think that's the first step. But, you know, on a more practical level, and I think this is where Iran's uniqueness comes into play, um, many of these young people, they, the young people I knew, they either dropped out of middle school or they dropped out of high school because they said, well, they would always tell me, you know, look, look at that guy over there. He got a college education. He's making as much money as I am, or he's doing the same job that I am. And so for them, there was no benefit in get, getting a higher education because ultimately they would be doing the same thing. So I think on a very practical level, it's um, developing more um, either work study programs, job training opportunities, skills training opportunities, so that young people don't have, aren't forced to make that decision between staying in school and working, um, where they can have the ability to gain that human capital that can be helpful for them down the line. Um, and then again, you know, on another level, a lot of these youth, at least in Iran, they're working in the informal sector. Um, many of them are on short-term contracts. Um, their employers, for instance, they don't pay them on time. There's, a, you know, they, there's three, four, five month, month delays in getting, um, getting their wages paid. And so, um, you know, revisiting labor laws in Iran, um, providing disincentives to employers who, um, you know, delay wages, um, providing more benefits to short-term contract workers like these youth, um, social insurance benefits, for instance, that would make them, um, give them not only a sense of financial security and well-being, but also make them feel as if they belong within that sort of urban fabric. I think um, these would go a long way towards um, improving the holistic well-being of these youth um, in Iran, at least. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, um, you don't have to address this question, but it just I was wondering um, if you, by any chance, have stayed in touch with your. Um, uh, uh, research interviewees and um do you know how they're doing on their um this latest of <laughs> the events the uh, pandemic that has hit us all um unfortunately. Or, or have you like uh gained any sort of information uh, so i've been in t i've been in touch with them but um the last time i was in touch with them it was before the covid pandemic hit um most of them, some of them are, you know, they're in universities, the ones who had sort of, were a little better off than their counterparts. They're either in university, they opened up their own shops or, um, you know, they're, they're working and they're actively trying to carve a better life for themselves. But, you know, others have, unfortunately, um, I, and I wasn't able to get in touch with them, but sort of I heard through the communities that they fell through the cracks and whether that actually happened or not. That remains to be seen, but you know, rumors abound in Iran. But um, none of them really were able to escape objectively escape poverty by leaps and bounds. But many of them gained again; they gained um, resources and wins that were valuable to them. And that you know, when I asked them, they said, "Oh yeah, yeah, you know, we're middle class now, even though you know, objectively." right um, on an income scale they're not but you know they don't feel that way so yeah again i think it's important yeah. that the meanings that they attach to their to yeah. their own lives is important yeah that's really fascinating um let me thank you again for the wonderful research you're doing and also for being here with us today um it's been a pleasure talking to you, you. And good luck with the continuation of your research thank you so much it's a pleasure